Robin, such a joy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, Casey. I'm really excited about today's interview. And the main reason is because I recently finished your book, Take Your Shot. And for the people listening, highly recommend this book, but we'll dive more into detail soon. And there were so many key points and key learnings and subtle things along the way. So I really want us to explore some of these more in depth today. But the best place to begin, I feel, is in your book, you mentioned the business is a game. And I'm curious to know, what are your rules of the business game? Yeah, so, well, I, I share similar thoughts on this to Simon Sinek. So he talks about the infinite game, basically. Um, in my view, a lot of business owners, they take business far too seriously. And so it takes the edge off it. Um, at the end of the day, we started a business in the first place because we wanted to create a bit of freedom for ourselves. We wanted it to be fun and fulfilling and also, most importantly, make us a bit of money. Um, but I think if one of those sort of three, the trifecta ends up sort of um, falling down, all of a sudden it just takes the edge off it. Um, but one of the interesting things which Simon Sinek talks about in The Infinite Game is... Uh, and he, he highlights this really succinctly, probably better than I could. But what he says is like in a game of sport, for example, you have like rules of engagement and there's a set time period. And then at the end of that time period, when the referee or umpire blows their whistle, that's it. And there's generally a winner or a loser. In some instances, there's a draw, right? But in business, though, I, I think a lot of business owners feel that the game they're playing is a bit like that, that, that it's it's win or lose. It's yes or a no, I'm in or I'm out. And they make it very binary, especially when it comes to things like, and I know this is something I talk about in, in the book, but making goals for yourself, goal, setting smart goals can actually be really detrimental to a business owner because it's a win-lose theory. You either achieve your goal or you don't. And quite often I see people falling short of their goals and then feeling a little bit down about it. But the goal is is just a goal. We shoot for it and we get detached. We should be detached from the outcome. The real goal in business is actually to stay in it for as long as you choose to. So that could be to a point whereby you want to exit or maybe you just decide that I'm going to retire or give up or go and get a job or whatever it is. But during up until you make that decision, the goal is just to stay in business for as long as you possibly can do. So, you know, that's where you start to then get down into the nuances, the foundations of business around sort of building recurring sustainable revenue within the business, making sure that your business has a certain level of profitability, that you're also sensible to a certain extent, you know. Um, business isn't just about like like some games where, you know, it's all about attack. Um, in sports, you also have a defense, right? So there's also that there's times when you want to push on, there's times when you want to take a, take stocks, take a step back and just protect your your you know your 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 gateposts around you to make sure that you, you you don't go out of business so what that looks like is just having you know a bit of being sensible setting setting up a rainy day fund and just paying into that little by little when you're on the attack and things are going well just take some of those profits to set them to one side and if you can get to a point whereby you've got three to six months worth of sort of operating expenses saved up your your world and your sort of mindset will shift dramatically because you're coming at it from a place of, well, if this doesn't work out, I'm actually still okay because I've got something to fall back on. I love this idea of the different rhythms. It's true that you can't always be full on. You need to like rest and recover. I wrote a post the other day about business being a marathon and not a sprint. And it's the same idea. We can't just be a hundred percent on a super intense attack. We need that step back, not only to, to reach out, but also to reflect. Because if we don't have that pause to reflect, then we don't have clarity on our direction if we don't call it goals. And I actually came to the same realization sometimes with smart goals, which is that they could be discouraging. And I feel the goals are more uplifting when they're input goals. So they're goals on things that you have an input on. So if you decide as a goal to post four times a week, for instance, that's something you can control. If you decide that your goal is to get 2,000 likes for each post you do, that's out of your control. You can influence it and learn from it, but it's out of your control. So I find that's more uplifting. And I like this idea of the infinite game and enjoying the process. And actually, this is linked to a question that I had in mind for today. As I was reading your book, I don't know why this question sort of emerged, which is if you have a person, a business owner, maybe someone listening now who is really excited about their, let's say goal, but vision, destination of 
maybe growing their business, having more clients, and they don't enjoy the process or part of the process they need to get there. And I was thinking this is also true for people who want to get fitter and they don't enjoy fitness. And of course, we could say you could automate it, you could delegate it and outsource this. But let's say that this business owner is starting off and they can't. How can they manage to trick themselves in enjoying the journey, to shift their perspective so that they actually reach their goal? Because I love discipline, but I don't think that's a sustainable way if really the the journey is grinding. So I guess my question is, if this person has a specific vision in mind they're super excited about, but a big chunk of the journey is something they really don't like, how can they manage that? Yeah, the, the um, analogy which comes to mind for me around this is, um, you, you talked about sort of it being a marathon, not a sprint. So I think having a bit of self-awareness about what is your make your makeup, what type of business owner or entrepreneur are you? Um, it's a bit like you can't expect Usain Bolt to run a marathon because he's just not built for it. He's d- designed his whole training, you know, and his 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 um, his nutrition, his exercise plan, the races that he enters is all built around him running sprints and winning them. Right, the hundred meters, the two hundred meters, and maybe the four hundred meters. Whereas you look at somebody like Mo Farah, for it, on the other hand, you know, he's he's skinny, his nutrition's completely different. He's, you know, he doesn't have the big muscle, huge muscles that the sprinters have got. He's designed for running long, long distances. Um, and you put the two of them against each other, and it's not a fair race in any in either discipline, right? Even if you tried to sort of meet in the middle and get them both to run a 5K, it just it wouldn't make sense. And I think a lot of business owners, they are blissfully unaware of what type of makeup they've got. For you know what's their dna have they got that entrepreneurial dna that kind of stands them in and are they entering the right race as well i see a lot of business owners who get very excited about it but they just don't have the right makeup to run a business because there are some you know it's it's not a journey which starts here and just gradually glides up like that in a nice linear fashion right it's it's a it's like spaghetti hoops going all over the place that's what the journey of a business owner looks like um so you've got to be prepared for like shit times you've got to be prepared for that that dip to happen that you know when life gets hard you you know you might have some like i and i get this right even as the fearless business coach i'm not immune to this stuff happening it's just called life right i've got nine and seven year old kids they have school holidays they get ill there's there's natural periods of seasonality within my life that i have to pay attention to if i just try and work through that you know, and grind it out and work all hours under the sun. Well, one, I'll get burnt out and I'm no use to anybody. My, myself, my clients, my wife, my kids, my family, friends. Like, I'm no use to anybody if I end up getting ill myself. Um, and the second thing is if I just focused on my business, I'd end up divorced. Why would why would my family want to hang out with me if I'm never around? Just again, it doesn't make sense. So getting that balance right is, is really hard. And there are sometimes, I'll be really honest, Katie, right because i think sometimes people are too afraid to talk about this stuff there's times when i have a childish little stanch and stamp my feet because i might be in there you know driving my girls to swim club or playing with like my daughter's dollies and things like that the games which i get roped into thinking oh god i've got this really important thing at work that i need to be doing i have moments like that and it and it's really frustrating but you know the way i encourage clients and the way i sort of um, rationalize this and get through it is I'm kind of like okay that thought is just a reminder that when I do get back to my desk I need to get that thing done so how can I now deal with this and quickly because I need to be present for my daughters and present for my family in a way that I'm not going to forget it again so it could be something simple like hey Siri add a reminder to do x y and z so that when I come back to my desk I know the to-do items there and I can get it done um but yeah, if you, if you're not if you can't um, change your hats in business, you're gonna really struggle. It's like it it is a juggling act, and there will be tough times. There's some great times, don't get me wrong, but there are also some really rubbish times as well. In amongst that, one of the things that helps us in those moments is reconnecting with our why and purpose. And I know that this is what everybody talks about, but there's a reason why everybody talks about it. And you also mention it in your book take your shot. And I particularly like that they were the two whys. Why do you do it? And why did the clients choose to work with you? I'm curious, what is 
your why? Why do you do what you do? So I, I um, it's taken me a long time to sort of form my why in in many respects. I, th- I think it's a, it's a bit of a journey. So I set up my first business. Well, b- before that, I used to work for a medical devices company for four years, and I learned every which way how not to run a business. Um, the guy who ran that business was brilliant, like so creative when it came to the product design, um, really innovative, but he just had no clue about running a business. And it was just a, a end up being quite a, it was a toxic place to be as an employee. It was a, um, it, they didn't make any money. Um, they worked us incredibly hard and didn't really reward us a lot of the time. And I des- I decided in that at that point, when I set up my business, it was always on the cards I wanted to run a business, but I wanted to get some practical experience first. When I run my own business, that's not how I'm going to run it. I'm going to make sure that my employees, in my own crazy way, I'll make sure that they feel valued, that I'm, I'm teaching them good skills, I'm rewarding them for the, the great work which they do. Um, and then when I did eventually set up my first business, then I realized, I was like, oh, that's why this guy struggled so much because now I'm having to do all of the things that he was doing. So in the, in that first job, I was just a technician. I only had really one role of responsibility. Now all of a sudden I'm responsible for sales and marketing and HR and all the rest of the hats. I'm like, ah, okay, I've learned something here. I need to be humble. It wasn't his fault. He's just struggling with all of the same stuff that clearly all business owners struggle with. And as I grew that agency and then latterly then sold it and started coaching, well, when I set up the coaching practice, um, I wanted to try and just take the edge off it for the business owners that I work with. I wanted them to not go through those struggles or at least learn through my experience and my mistakes all those 20 plus sort of years ago. Um, So it wasn't quite so painful. I I didn't discover mentoring and coaching until about eight years into my first business, into my, in my agency days. And I was like, God, what a mistake was that to, you know, to, to have not gifted myself that extra level of support and help for those first eight years and try and figure it all out on my own. Um, and yet look, it was great. It was a great experience, but equally I could have made life a lot easier on myself if I've, if I'd actually reached out and got some help. I, I don't know. I don't know what a stupid part of my brain decided that when I stopped doing, cause I did a university degree at the same time as that first job, that when I finished uni, I had to stop reading. Right. But the biggest mistake ever when I, my life changed dramatically when I got into, um, I, used to, I still do listen to a lot of audiobooks. My library's like about 280 audiobooks deep over the last sort of 10 years. Um, uh, and I started meeting coaches, mentors and learning again. Uh, best thing I ever did. I can totally relate to that. And I feel that every time I read a book, just like reading your book, and this is one of the reasons I love having the podcast. Most of the time I read the books beforehand. Then you've got that extra deadline, that extra pressure, and it makes you read them. I feel every time it opens up new windows, a new door, a new perspective. Sometimes there's reminders of things you know that maybe you are applying. Sometimes things you know, but you haven't been applying. And sometimes there's a totally new inside. Uh, I think in in the case of, of your book, what I really loved was the clarity of the the product and how crystal clear it was what the outcome would be for the people signing up mm. and how they're delivering this and just being able to formulate that really crystal clearly. Of course, I'm clear on my products and services, but crystal clear, you know, not just overview clear, just to the the, the almost micro precision of it being totally exact, what it is you deliver, what is the result, how much does it cost, the money back guarantee, da, 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 like all very, very clearly. I think that makes a huge difference. So coming back to, to your book, the three pillars that you mentioned in it are around the product, the pricing and the proposition. I memorized them with the three Ps, though you say product design, pricing and value proposition. Can you touch a bit upon this? Why the three pillars out of all the things we could be doing in business? Why do you feel the three are the most fundamental? So most people, when they think about growing a business, they think about marketing. And the mar- again, the marketing, I'm going to sound like a dinosaur, but the marketing game has shifted like in the last 20 years when I, I, my first business was doing websites. And like back then you could get a business card and a BNI networking like membership and you could go and speak to people and get clients. Right? Marketing was really easy back then. I think now, like with, I mean, you not only have you got all of the different apps and different sort of social media um, platforms and things like that to market through, 
there's still all of the old traditional ways of marketing in terms of like you know um email outreach and um you know billboards advertising and various things like that um um but there's also 10 times the number of businesses registered today than there were 20 years ago which means that so not only is the 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 market completely like overly saturated everybody's in this very confusing space of where they're trying to like just you know constantly you just see these posts on social media buy my stuff buy my stuff buy my stuff they're not actually really adding any value they just think that that's how you market is like wave their arms around and say it's like the it's like the men the looking men on the beaches where they open up their jacket and they've got a stack of glasses right hey sunglasses you know come and buy my stuff it's just it's just not a way to do it so the chat the challenge with i have with obviously you need to market yourself in order to get clients the, the problem i have with it is that um imagine you've got like a fiat cinquecento right 500 cc engine little cute little fiat cinquecento and you add rocket fuel into it what what happens when you add rocket fuel into a fiat cinquecento katie you're on mute at the moment <laughs> Yes, I guess it crashes. No, it uh, probably takes off and crash. Well, that, that's it. That, so that's a, the first assumption. People think it goes faster. Well, it, it can't because it's only got the it's got a five hundred cc engine, so it can't possibly go any faster. And rocket fuel is highly combustible, so it's likely it's going to end in a fire. Okay. Um, and if you in this analogy, the the Fiat Cinquecento's engine is like your business engine. So that's the, the rickety little engine that's got the sales and marketing and the accounts and everything sort of, you know, bubbling around, right? The rocket fuel is more clients. So most most business owners, when they're starting out, they can um, uh, wing their way to 85K. They can get to VAT threshold in the UK, right? Quite easily with their rickety little engine. You add too many clients in and at some point it's just going to explode because the systems and processes just aren't there to sustain that level of growth. So marketing, adding more clients, isn't the best approach. You've got to be a lot smarter than that. So you talked about the productization piece again a lot of the small business owners, especially in the service sector space, they think that the way to sort of charge for their services to do it at an hourly rate. The only person who hourly rate services um, is, is the business owner, right? Because in order for them to make more money, they've got to sell more hours if they want to pay their mortgage and put food on their table. They make it about them, right? Imagine then that you have a technician selling something at an hourly rate, a web designer, an accountant, a lawyer, or whoever. So they're selling the service at an hourly rate, doing the technician's job. Are they going to get better or worse at their job over time? They're going to get better at it, right? So as they get more efficient and deliver a better quality service, and they keep their hourly rate roughly the same, because which idiot made up the rule that we can only put our prices up once a year and by 10%, so we can't really expand our businesses or our hourly rates, so they get better at it, more efficient, create better results. And yet they end up making less money as a result of it, right? So they end up having to sell more hours. It's it's like, it, it doesn't work. It's a broken, a flawed business model. So where you ha have to pivot then is to think about like the amazing results which you deliver for your clients. I always tell my clients like, you need to become a master at figuring out the return on investment your clients get when they invest in you. If you can if you can figure that out, build that calculator and help your clients figure it out, you make yourself like everybody needs you at that point because you figure out how to do one thing really well for one specific type of client, which becomes systemized and routine and pro produces predictable results, i.e. an expert. And at that point, like experts, well, how, how much do experts get paid generally? Not more, no, than they... they... Yes, I think they can. They don't charge by the hour. I think that's like exactly like you put it in your book. They charge by the results, or by the package. So they have this clear packaging around delivering that result and outcome. Yeah. So talk, talk, I tell you what, Katie, if you're open to it, we could do a little bit of. We could just talk through now, just as a bit of a case study. If you're open to sharing it, some of your products and services which you do. So. Talk, talk me through some of your sort of one of your signature products, which you sell. I think we could go through the, the corporate package that I sell for corporate companies. And so that's three months of monthly workshops. So it's three workshops. So three monthly workshops and that's 10K. So okay. 10K for three workshops and it focuses 
on, well, I have different ones, but let's say uh, the one on mindful self-discipline. Okay. And so what's, what would you say is the end result that the corporates are looking for when they work with you? In this case, for this product, it's a focus on enabling the employees to have greater proactivity, taking ownership, responsibility, and delivering at a higher level of performance, being more focused and less distracted. Okay. And, and why, is that, why is that important? <laughs> why is that important? Uh, I mean, I think it just increases overall the the performance in the company, but also in this case with the proactivity, it enables greater retainment and it enables also, it means that they have lower their costs of employing new people, retainers in, so then the company culture improves and with the company culture improving, people again deliver at a high level, the well-being is stronger, people feel happier. It's great. Okay. <laughs> I'd get so it. I, I'm going to ask a very difficult question now, Kate. Do I? Be, be specific with some of those outcomes. How, how do you measure the change? Yeah, this is kind of my struggle every time because what I work with is around things like well-being, high level of performance. Of course, I could just do a survey beforehand in terms of engagement of the employees and before and after the program or in terms of how much they're retaining before and after and take a, an actual survey and study. Uh, I think I never think of it that way, but I, I did see in your book that there was this idea of a question, 10 points, doing a survey before, afterwards. And I think that would, yeah, be one way of measuring it. Cool. So, so the self-assessment is definitely one way of measuring it, but when you're in the, in the sales pitch and you're speaking to the decision makers about whether they're going to hire you for that three month program at 10 K, um, at the back of their mind, they're thinking, how can we make more money? That's like the one the one metric, which like true north for most business owners when they're making sort of buying decisions. But there were several metrics there, which you measured, you rattled off in fairly quick succession. So if you can, if you can measure productivity and you, there's no precise science to this, by the way, I know I'm, I asked you for specifics, but um, it might be something like if you looked at all of the clients that you've worked with and their productivity increased by on average 11.4%, you can then have a conversation with the key decision maker and say, well, okay, 10K in, if we can increase productivity by 11.4%, and it may be a little bit more, it may be a little bit less, but on average, we change it by 11.4%. What difference would that make to your business? Yeah, if we can reduce absenteeism by, you know, on average 1.8 days per employee per year, how much is that going to save your business or increase your top line and, and, and increase productivity? Um, if we can ensure that this year, rather than having 37 people leave your company, we reduce that number down to 32. How much does retaining those extra five employees mean to your business? What, how, what difference will it make? The more specific you get and the more you can help your customers to f figure out what those numbers and metrics look like and the impact it can have on their business, the odds of them booking you for that piece of work will drastically go up. I can't guarantee that it would definitely get you over the line, but it would certainly increase the odds of them booking you. But the next thing though is, if you think about, Katie, um, a company that you've worked with where you know you've created a big impact. Okay, you don't have to give me specifics because I know it's probably sensitive, but give us an idea of what size business are we talking here? I mean, what? the company I have in mind, they were quite small, so less than 20 employees. It was startup. Okay. So 20 employees though, they could easily be doing probably somewhere two, three, four million revenue. Okay. So if you come in and increase productivity by 11.4% on 2 million, you've just increased their revenue by 250K nearly. I think the, the struggle I have with this is how you would measure the productivity because what I'm thinking is this sometimes shows up in the company in very different ways. So sometimes it's just the communication is leaner. Sometimes it's people taking more responsibility for the activities they're doing. Sometimes it's even people just taking more breaks. So I feel it's not a sort of clear cut cookie of exact productivity. I feel overall the performance, the well-being, the communication, like a lot of things improve, but I find it difficult to quantify that into numbers. Okay. So Katie, you didn't realize it, but you just swore at me. You just used a swear word. You didn't, didn't actually say it, but what you said was it depends. Okay. 
So where it depends comes in, it means that you're that there's too many variables there, right? So um, in terms of like being able to deliver a, a systemized process that delivers predictable outcomes and results, you that's your job is to remove some of the variables where it depends. It could be in maybe the types of clients you work with. It could be in terms of what you actually do with those clients. It could be you're working in too broad a range of different areas that you can kind of pull the levers with. And so therefore, by virtue of that, the results are going to be slightly unpredictable. So imagine though, imagine though, now knowing that, what, what could you put in place or what could you do to start to create more predictable results that in a way that you could help them also to have oversight on what it is that you're trying to impact? I mean, if I was, if I had a clearer sort of, I suppose, niche or specific thing that I measured in terms of the productivity or performance or well-being, depending which one I focused on well-being, I could focus on less people going on burnout, for instance. Yeah. Um, that would be one clear factor measured if it was a company with high levels of stress. And then if that was the main aim of the product, then that would be something specific. I guess what I'm yeah. thinking is per uh, product suite, because obviously I also have products for and services for entrepreneurs, which is, again, very different. There needs to be one clear way of measuring it. You got it. Yeah. It's, there's a great book called Measure What Matters. And I, I tell you a little anecdote. I know this is possibly going off on a slight sort of tangent here, but um, when I was trying to figure out who I wanted to work with and who, who you know, and what Fearless was about in the early days, so eight, eight years ago, um, I got invited. I, did, I was doing a number of talks and I got invited into a big law firm here in Gloucestershire at about 200 employees. And um, uh, they wanted me to do a piece of work around sort of employee engagement. So, and it, I didn't, and now it's not really my, that's not my zone of genius. My thing is product pricing sales. But back then I was like, I need to try out some different things to see where, where the hat fits basically the best. So I went in and I, I um, they were sort of interviewing me and asking me what, what kind of a difference I could make. And I said, well, why, what prompted you to kind of, you know, for us to have this conversation? I said, well, um, we've got a really high staff turnover rate. So solicitors are leaving when they get to about four to six years into their career with working with us. And at, at the moment, last year, we lost 40 out of 200. So 20%, really, which is a big number. Next question, all I asked was, well, just out of curiosity, like what does it cost you to replace a solicitor? And I had the HR director and one of the partners and a couple of other people in the room, and they all looked at each other. Well, we don't know, but how is this relevant to us? I was like, well, let me help you work it out. So I, I got a bit of paper out um, and did a, a sort of beer mat calculation on what it would cost. And I, uh, how, long to, how long does it take to train up a new solicitor? What's the recruitment process? Um, how many partner hours are taken up? What's the average you know, cost per partner hour? I'm fortunate I married a lawyer, so I have a little insight into how law firms work. So that kind of worked in my advantage a little bit. So I asked all these questions and then I came up with a number. I said, well, this is costing you. And they helped me come up with this calculation. I said, every new um, solicitor you bring into this firm is costing you £225,000. And you lost 40 last year, that's 6 million. What are we going to do about it? And their eyes popped out of their head and they had no idea. And I, so I just created a calculator for them to figure out what was the, well, in this case, what was the cost of inaction? If they didn't fi fix this problem, how much was it costing them? So that's another way of looking at it. It might not be in terms of improvements and more revenue. It might actually be, well, how can we save a bit of money or just let's make life a little bit better for our employees. That's a good place to start. So if we've got fewer employees on long-term sick leave, we're winning. How, well, how much do you want to reduce it by? And you can, you can bat this back over to the business owner you're sat in front of, Katie, and co-create what a good, a full and remarkable outcome and result looks like for them. Now, in the process of them co-creating that with you, they feel empowered. They feel like they're being a part of this decision, which this journey, which they're about to embark on. So that £2 million business, and if you save them 200 k all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, 10 k feels a little bit cheap to me. They're getting a good deal right? Yes. Yes. I yeah, I'm glad you agree with me. I'm glad you agree with me. Okay. Now this will only work for the video. This may not work quite so well for the podcast, but uh, the audio side of it, but are you willing to play with me? Go on. I'm going to play a game. Okay. When people try and solve 
pricing problems or most business problems, they use this, okay? And they try and solve it intellectually. Now, most people know that when you uh, make a buying decision in your business, it's mostly based on emotions, like 90% plus, purely based on emotion. Have I got a good feeling about this? Have I got confidence in this person's ability to deliver great results? Does it feel like it's, you know, a wise decision for us to make for our business? Am I going to enjoy it when I hand over the, you know, the money to this person? Am I going to enjoy it still when they do the work and then we get the results at the end of it? So it's all based on feelings and emotions, okay? So your 10K price point was based on what intellectually you thought was a, a reasonable, a fair and reasonable amount of money to charge for the great work which you do, okay? Um, is there a world... A future version of KT, a universe somewhere out there in the future, maybe, I don't know, a year, five years, 10 years, where maybe you're charging 100K for the work which you do. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't say no. You you looked off there, which there was that direction for you, which tells me you're actually tapping into your heart, not your head. You were dreaming for a moment and you went, yeah, I could do that. So your heart tells us. So what we've done is we've created bandwidth now. We've created bandwidth between 10K and 100K. Okay? So future potential, this is where you could be, will be in the future. And this is where we're at right now as of today. And there's 90,000 numbers that sit between that. Okay? Remember, we're not going to solve this intellectually, this problem. Right? And you just agreed with me, 10K is possibly a little bit on the cheap side. Yes. Yep. Okay. So you don't have to say anything right now. I'm going to say some numbers and then we're going to figure something out. Okay. So which is possibly where you should be charging 12K, 15K, 18K, 19, 20K, 25K, 28K, 30K. It's a good poker face you've got there. 35, 36, 40K, 50K. Yeah, there we go. You just went up there. I don't know if you saw, you probably were blissfully yeah, aware felt, of it. Yeah, I felt mine going up, yeah. Yeah. So believe it or not, that's how much you should be charging for the work which you're doing. The... <laughs> yeah. That was, that was your uh, unconscious, your subconscious there, telling us how much you're really worth, telling yourself how much you're really worth, believe it or not. Yeah. You've gone really deep in thought there. Wow. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, yeah, that sounds okay. That sounds okay. That doesn't sound too scary. Yeah. It all depends how you product it, right? It probably wouldn't just be for three workshops. But if I included other things in between, maybe if I made it a six month thing, monthly workshop, maybe a bit of that, then definitely 50. Easy. Yeah. See, you can add, I, I never, I don't believe in like ever just quintupling your prices and not adding any extra value in. There have been some some instances, businesses where I've worked with where genuinely they were just underselling themselves so much, like selling themselves so short um, that we have been able to dram dramatically increase the prices for the same service. But I'm I'm a big believer in you know where you increase your prices, do add, do stack some extra value in there. But you've got more bandwidth at 50k to be able to add, add like create a full and remarkable solution, so that you can from there then guarantee you're going to get even better. You know at least guarantee the result, but probably get even better results, like far extend it. I bet there's an element of your work where you actually feel a little bit stressed with even the work you're doing now, or not stressed, but stretched at 10K for the, the work which you're doing. You feel like you kind of owe something to the clients, whereas at 50K, you've got a partner here which you're working with, mm. right? And you just said, you immediately went into, how can I add more value? Well, I could do some amazing things with this. We can do some more workshops. We can do, the, you know, so you got really creative with it. Wonderful. I can't believe we totally switched roles. <laughs> I don't have any room for questions. Amazing. And we're already like approaching sort of the last few minutes. So sort of re-reversing roles. What do you feel is the most common transformation that you see in your clients? If we're thinking about the exchange we just had right now or in general, what do you feel after they work with you is the most common transformation they go through? So most people would assume that it's going out and actually getting a sale. Like in your instance, going out and, and picking up a gig for 50K, you would think that that would be the dream outcome. It's not, it actually happens before that. Having the confidence to be fearless and get into a room with the next five to 10 prospects and say the words 50K, as much as you're 
helping them to see the value, you're also, there's a process which you go through where you're kind of convincing yourself that this is the right route to go down and this is the right package and I'm worth that, okay? So it, it's actually that step where the breakthrough happens, getting in the room and saying the big number. We don't care about outcomes at this point. We don't care whether you get the gig or not. If you can find yourself in that room uttering those immortal words, it's just 50K to work with me, you've, you, you've, you're like 90% of the way there and it's only then a matter of time before somebody says yes to it. And, uh, and it's what it comes down to is that, um, you know, we talked about goals at the start of it, smart goals. Everybody attaches, especially in business, to the sale, to the making money bit. It's it's really not. You learn through the process. It's not about the destination. It's the journey, you know, that is is where you get the most amount of learnings. It's that part where you're building muscle memory. It's like you don't just go to the gym and then, you know, after one or two or three sessions, you got, you know, six pack abs and biceps, Right. You you go there for three, four, five weeks and you look the same. You might feel slightly different internally, but you kind of look the same. You know, week six, seven, eight, then you start to see the external transformation, but the internal transformation's already happened because you built the muscle memory up, you've got the habits, you're eating better, you're doing the laps, that you know, the, the exercises, the reps, um, and the, the right endorphins are all happening, but the transformations happen internally. It's not about the end result. It's always internal first. It's always internal transformation. And then it turns into external results. That's what I love so much about coaching is how the people's inner world shape their own beliefs about themselves, their own sense of confidence, their own awareness. And then that always materializes in external results. That's uh, where the magic is. Wonderful. Robin, I've enjoyed this interview so much. Thank you so much for sort of coaching me on the spot. I always love being coached. Uh, last words maybe about your book or last few notes that you want to leave the show with. Yeah, of course. So one of the things which um, people mistake like fearless uh, being is is about, they mistake it with the word reckless, right? But that's not what fearless is about. Fearless is about fearing the things in business ever so slightly less that stop us from achieving our goals. So that would be a little bit of fear about you stepping into that room about saying 50K, but that you can overcome that. There's only two things that might happen here and neither of them are that bad. So one might be, you might feel that you're looking at, you know, you look a bit stupid, but that can be mitigated because most of the people will have forgotten about you and be on with their lives, you know, by this time tomorrow. So that that's not really an issue. It might be that you can potentially lose a bit of money, but again, that could be mitigated because it might not be you jump straight from 10 to 50K. Maybe you start by, let's make a small leap from 10 to 20K and see what we can build on with that, build my confidence up around that. So it's kind of more so around just fearing those little things ever so slightly less that will stop you from achieving your goals, increasing your prices, getting into a room full of people and, and pitching, you know, for 60 seconds, getting onto a stage or a podcast and actually telling people about what you do, switching on video, like doing videos, it's those little things that we can take calculated risks around that we know are going to improve our circumstances. I love what you said about nice goals at the start as well. There's little things that are in your control that you can do today you compound those over time and they make a massive difference. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's, that's my final words, Katie. Amazing. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you for also coaching me. Thank you for joining today. Thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Do we want to mention where they can get the book as well? Cause that go was going to be a good Go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, I've got some signed copies as well for everybody who's watched this or listened to this as well of take your shot. So Katie talked about her experience of reading the book and what she learned from it. So, uh, you can get those by heading to fearless.biz forward slash TYS. It's all lowercase, so TYS for take your shot. Hopefully, I'll send you the link, Katie, so we can include it in the show notes. Amazing. Thank you. My pleasure.